as you know that um, I'm busy with a series on spiritual warfare. One hallelujah. Warfare. Okay, nobody loves war. Nobody likes to, not likes war. Nobody wants to fight. Okay, and we are taught from school times already. I don't know if you've been at school where they told you that bullying one another or fighting with people is allowed. Been in such a school? Come for counseling? Education. Okay. Not the right thing to do. But however, we're living in a world where we are taught that fighting and raging a war is not good. Okay? Or, and then we find that um, it happens all the time. I mean, we've got Ukraine and we've got um, Russia now at war, and we've got all the rest of the world saying, no, we're not there, but they are involved. Again, they are fighting. I mean, the Bible says that in the last days, what is it that the people are going to shout out and say a lot of times? They're going to say, peace here and peace there and peace, peace, peace. And all of a sudden, a tremendous strategy is going to fall over them. So they're thinking what they are saying and where they're heading, peacefulness is going to be the result of them just saying it. But all of a sudden, it's going to happen absolutely. The people saying, peace, peace. But there's another side of the coin that we didn't realize. That is that we are getting um, brainwashed in this idea that war and raging a war is wrong. Whereas the fact of the matter is that we are currently engaged in a war. So as Christians and believers, we want to stand back and say, oh, this is so bad. We do not need to go to war. We, d we want everything to be sunshine and roses and chocolates and, and candlelight dinners. Now, whatever the case may be. But the fact is, when I said from the beginning, if you want to be living a life of spiritual um, victory, spiritual endurance, spiritual... Um, Greatness. Basically, there are four keys. The first key that we spoke about was we must become aware of this invisible war. I'm not going to repeat myself there. There is an invisible war. And you are currently involved in it. You are there. If you can say with honesty that Nothing in this world, nowhere where you are, touches you. You are just cruising by. And none of the harms, none of the bad things, none of the, the things that are surrounding us in this world touches you. Really, such a person, I really need to. Because they must be some sort of a ghost. He doesn't touch you. We are engaged in a war. Every time when you look at advertisements, every time when you listen to radio stations and you listen to the news, every time when you look at movies, when, every time when you, when you talk to people, every time when you see a newspaper article, every now and then you see the bad and bad things happening. And if it doesn't touch you, I mean, inside here, you must be deader than dead. Okay? But when it touches you, and you can distinguish between, say, it's good and right or good and evil, immediately it tells you that you are engaged. Because somewhere along the line, somebody is going to say something, and they're going to challenge you to get part of that. And then you will have to say, yay or nay, yes or no. Just be there at that point, making a choice. Warfare. What am I going into or am I going to stand again? Where is this fight? As I said before, the, the major battlefield that every Christian, every person in this world, every person, the greatest battlefield is in their heads. 
in their ears. In other words, it's your thoughts. It's in people. You're not going to do something if you haven't given thought to it. Don't come with, I'm, I'm saying this now. I'm not a psychologist. But I'm, don't tell me that things just happen to you. Oh, I did this all of a sudden. And when I look back, I say, oh, my goodness, I've done this whatever bad thing. I believe that everybody are doing things conscience. You know what you're doing. You don't really know what the consequences there of what it might have for you at all, what the consequences are going to be. But you definitely know that what you are doing is not really wrong, it's absolutely risky. Somewhere along the line, somebody told you in the, in the far past that, I don't like that. It's a risk. Something is not good there. Okay? And that will kind of ring yeah, in your ear when you are um, thinking of doing it. And then eventually when you are doing it, that person said that. Tells you immediately, and you know what's right and what is wrong. And that tells me you're in a war zone. I told you before, when you're in war, a lot of Christians that are now brainwashed or manipulated in the sense that we don't want war, we don't want to fight, we want peace, we want comfort and stuff like that. When you're in battle and you're raging a war and, and you're fighting and, and your bodies are falling and the, you are hurt, okay? And you hide behind a rock or somewhere, and you're going to sit there and you eat your terrible dry food, the rations that they gave you, the rat pack, okay, in the of South Africa. And you sit there and you eat the dried crusts, the little thingies that you squeeze out, and you say, oh my soul, this is not party style or quality. I'm not so fulfilled with my life now. This is terrible. Really a soldier would sit on the battlefield saying that while the bombs are exploding all around him, people are shooting at him. He's not going to give two thoughts about what it tastes like. He's not even going to chew it properly. He's just going to eat like a pig and just and swallow. Like my mom used to say, you swallow now. We're in a hurry. You can do later. They don't think about these comforts at that moment. What are you supposed to think? There's an aim. There's a purpose for your life. There's something that you need to do. You need to get there. You have to defend something. As a soldier, you stand your ground. As an introduction there for today as well. When I'm a soldier and I have to fight for something, or will I fight for something that I will fight for something that my mind is good. In our case now, obviously, if you didn't know this, as Christians, we stand and we fight for our faith. We fight for who we are. We fight for the truth. Can I make it more simple and plain to you? What are you fighting? It really Christians not fight for not fight for victory. You fight from because you and I. It doesn't matter what qualifications you have or that you've built up, or how strong you think you are, or even how strong you really are. But we are not a patch against what the enemy throw our way. There's no way in this world that any of us would have been able to sit here if it wasn't for God's grace. 
if it wasn't for God's grace. And how did he show his grace? By sending Jesus. Jesus Christ came, and he decided long before everybody was created, he decided, this is going to happen, and I'm going to stand in their stead, and I'm going to pay the price, because none of them will be able to do that. And those then, at the end, that believes in me, because I've done the work, will be seen as if they've done the work, as if they conquered. Don't be so bold and maybe arrogant as to think that I'm the one that's winning this battle. I'm not. Jesus Christ has already won the battle. And we are just standing there and saying, thank God. Praise the Lord Jesus for your mercy. And thank you for coming. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for um, conquering this thing. curse of this world. Second, I've broken up the second key. You must learn to appropriate God's protection. You must have to learn to appropriate God's protecting protection daily living. Daily living. Jesus told his disciples, I'm sending you into this world. Okay? Many times we say that we are these mighty warriors. And we say to people, yeah, you are a mighty warrior. You're a real Joshua. Mighty warrior. Which is great. But it's not through your own strength. If God is not the God that's with you, if God is not the God that endures you, if God is not the God, the God that clothes you or that gives you the armor to stand your ground, you won't stand a fraction of a second. So he sent us in. He says, I'm sending you in as sheep amongst wolves. That refers to daily living. Daily living. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. And in this world, we do have a battle. And it has an influence on our minds. We see things, we hear things, we experience things. The world comes with a lot of offers. They tell us, look at this drug, and look at this pleasure place, and look at this thing, and look at that, or do this. In some cases, a lot of Christians. Just tells him, don't do anything. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, don't swear, don't steal, don't do anything of those things. Just sit there. Be passive. I like what Chip Ingram says. He talks about himself and he says this. If you can be a Christian like that, just sitting over there, just sit. Do nothing. Lucifer is telling all the demons, guys, don't bother with him. If he can get all the Christians to be like him, he'll do our job for us. Nothing's going to happen. God wants us something um, to happen. Something needs to happen. Life that we we need to change this. We need to change this. We need to change our point of view. How is that going to happen? But let me come back to this. Talking about today, we've, firstly we spoke, this, um, learn to appropriate God's protection for daily living. The first one we had was the belt. And the belt heard around their loins, and that was to everything up and stiff and whatever. We, we spoke about that before. And the belt of truth, the thing that you know that is true about yourself and about God and about the Word and about this life. Then he says, after you have done that, on the armor, the breastplate, Some of the, depending on what degree of a soldier you were uh, in those days, 
was a hard brass thingy that they wore or nail plated thingy like webbing that they had from the neck down the legs okay, and that was all covered then with a robe but they've got that on and it says righteousness uprightness and that's a um, breastplate of righteousness was also known it or not as the heart protect the heart protect told you before don't look at the um the armor as something that you have to clothe every day and say now i'm putting on this and that. this is the armor is how you apply the truth or the truths how you apply god's word to everyday living now once that you've the belt now once that you know the truth about jesus christ as the lord and savior once you know that the word of god is the truth once you know that Jesus Christ is not just a historical person, but he's God that came to us. And God himself sacrificed him to save us. And you know this truth of the word. Then he says, put on the breastplate. Protect your heart. What happened? Normal world. You know the truth. You know what is right. Does it stop there? No, it doesn't. Because people will come to you and say, sure. But what about this? Ah, oh, that's not the truth. You're lying to yourself. No, let me explain to you what is the truth. You, you've been told a lie. That's where the breath Protect your heart. Say, I'm not going to accept that. I know what is the truth. This is protecting me. Put it on. And how do you put it on? By standing firm and say, I know what I know, I know. And nobody's going to change my mind. Because God's word is the truth. If you can tell me in the word that it's different, maybe I'll reconsider. But it's whatever you're saying, it's not the truth. Evaluate everything anybody tells you. Basis of and once you do that you got the breastplate you are standing firm righteousness or uprightness right living integrity in one's lifestyle and character conforming of our will to God's will although rooted in the object of righteousness that we already possess in our standing before God through the work of Christ. This breastplate of righteousness that guards and protects our hearts is the practical application of the truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Practical application. Just knowing the truth is not good enough. You have to apply. something that you see and they buy it, buy it. You are in a war. You're a soldier and you're walking down with a uniform and all the goods that you have with all the bullets and the guns and stuff. And you're just walking down there in the middle of the war zone and you say, I do not agree with this war. They're going to shoot you. Anyways. You have to apply it. They are going to target you. They are going to shoot at you. You will have to defend you whether you like it or not. Remember, Satan is out there. He's not there to play with you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to, like we said in the past, when we talk about him, he's like a lying, a roaring lying, walking about, and he looks whom he can, what do? Play with. Who he can devour. 
eat you up, tear you apart. That's his aim. Oh, it in the spoke about first thing that it does is deception deceives you, deceives you. I'm talking to Christians, I'm not talking to a normal person, I'm talking to a believer that has already accepted Jesus Christ. And you've heard about the truth and you've accepted the truth. And you've said that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of my life. And my life is according to His principles. This and this and this. Let me use an example. Okay. Say, for instance, I've been convinced that smoking, whatever, is wrong. And I'm a firm believer of that. Then one day, as a believer, with a crowd of people, somebody says to me, take a puff on this or just feel what it feels like. And I say to myself, no, no for a fact it's wrong. But uh, into the so-called and you take and you know what happens? See if you, then all of a sudden that person off out their lungs maybe. And they would taste, oh, this is bad. And now they feel see, this. And I think, that now, what does the devil do? Talk to you. When you're alone, go home. You walk into the house. Maybe they're going to know about it. You go to your bedroom. Nobody else said anything. But what's the devil going to do? He's going to condemn you. Condemnation. I tell you <laughs> that you're a Christian. You believe that smoking is a sin, and now look what you have done. You smoked. You're not a true Christian. God has not paid the price for you. Look at what you are able to do. You're a failure, man. You're a liar. That's what Satan's going to do. He deceives you, and when you fall into this trap, he's going to condemn you. And what's the result of condemnation of a person sitting in a situation like that? He sits full of guilt. Oh, God, love me. I'm useless. I'd like to note here, Satan not only uses deception and condemnation to neutralize believers, but also specializes in casting doubt on the very basis of God's goodness and means by which we have re received it. What is that? The gospel. What is the gospel? The good graces and the, the, the mercy of God that Jesus Christ came and He saved us. He's going to make you doubt your salvation. He's going to make you doubt of the truths. Happen? Has it happened? People sometimes fall, they stumble. It's not news. It's not a brand new thing. All of a sudden you see the neon sign there that um, righteous people can fall and they stumble and they're on the ground. Oh, my soul, I didn't know that. Whoa, this is a news flash. It's not news. It's been written in the Bible thousands of years ago already that said the just and the unjust walk the same road and both of them stumble and fall but the difference is the difference is that the just will stand up and shake it off and go ahead don't be fooled and be deceived by the fact that you stumble and you fall and you think now oh you see i have to now keep on lying down because now the bullets will fly over me no what can happen? Stand up. Shake it off. And what is the truth? The truth of the matter is First jo uh, James
Sorry, I just want to turn base. James 4 verse 17 says, when this happens, okay, it's inevitable, okay? This is inevitable. That means it is definitely going to happen to you. Not once, not twice, maybe. That's an it. Not in. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Satan is going to try to convince you that you are a loser. Okay? And when you stand up against him, what must you do? James 4, verse 17 says. Oh, sorry. First John 9, verse 1. Oh, turn around your Bible, Bibles, isn't it? Sorry. First John says, God says, and you can stand up to Satan and tell him this. God says, if I confess my sins, I fell, I stumbled. First John 9, 1. He says, if I confess my sins, he, that is God, is faithful and just to forgive my sins. Satan comes your way. I know the truth. 1 John 9, 1 says that when I confess my sins, Satan, God says that he is just and he will, and he's faithful. He will forgive me. I know I made a mistake. I know I stumbled. I know that I a cigarette and I puffed it. I'm, remember, I'm just using this as an example. Ne? I know I've done that. And I know I feel bad about it. But I go back to God and I say, God, please forgive me. I have stumbled. I fell down. But thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I, and I say, Lord, forgive me for this. And you forgive my sin. I can carry on from there. And it makes a better point. You stand against the Satan. That is how you apply this breastplate. You know what is the truth, the belt. Now the application thereof in Jesus' name. One John one. I got the name. See? Now that you know the truth, closing with this. Now that you know the truth, and you know how to apply. There are so many people. There are so many out people out there who know the truth. Full stop. Period. They don't know the truth. And how will they know the truth? The Bible says they will not know the truth unless there is someone that preach the truth. Who must preach the truth. Me. Yes. Only me. No. You. Yes. Us. We, the church, the body of Christ, how do we do that? Francis, that said, preach the gospel everywhere and to everybody, and if absolutely necessary, use words. So it simply means this. By our actions, we can also preach the gospel. Put a smile on your mug. Say something enduring to someone else. Encourage somebody. Tell them, good luck. If there's somebody that's sick, ask them, can I pray for you? Would you mind? And don't wait for an answer. Just do it. I do it. They think they walk circles around you sometimes. Scared, you're going to pray for them. 
pray for them. Somebody shows them. Christ loved us. We We are unable, actually, to love him. Loving us. So he is actually working here. Christ, we use him. But when, when Jesus Christ is in your heart, you cannot love and do good. Maybe you've got something, a talent. Maybe you can fix cars, lawnmower, something. The person that doesn't know the truth, sway them, I believe.